Okay, this section is about reactions in which uh, one reactant is present in limited supply. And the goal is to, uh, well, one of the goals is to determine which reactant is in limited supply in a reaction involving several reactants and determine the yield of a product based on the limiting reactant. Now, we really shouldn't say several reactants. More than likely, when you have a reaction occur, it's gonna be no more than two things reacting together. It's rare to have three things reacting together, although it can happen. Um, and the simple reason is, is that for things to react, they have to come into contact. And so two things coming into contact is tough enough. Having three things all collide at the right orientation and right time is pretty unlikely. So those are a lot more rare uh, reactants where there's more than two reactants. Okay. So let's take a look here. Now, this is actually covered in the previous section about stoichiometry. It's called the, uh, an amounts table. And we're going to go over an amounts table and how you construct one and what it might be useful for. So here, an amounts table is simply a table that shows you how much you're starting with, the amount you're starting with of everything, the change, and then what you end with. Uh, some people call it an ice table. So uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. But we're going to use this problem here as a demonstration of how you might construct an amounts table. Okay, so let's read through this. The metals industry was a major source of air pollution years ago. One common process involved roasting metal sulfides in air. So here you take pure lead, react it with pure oxygen, and you get lead 2 oxide and sulfur dioxide. This is a redox reaction. And we know it's a redox because we have pure lead here and then lead is in a compound on the other side of the equation. Okay, if 2.50 moles of lead two sulfide is heated in air, what amount of uh, O2 is required for complete reaction? Oh, you know what? I made a mistake. This should be lead two sulfide. Okay, uh, that makes more sense. But it's still a redox reaction because we have pure O2 here and oxygen is in, a, in, the, uh, is in the other side in a, in a substance. So if 2.50 moles of lead to sulfide is heated in air, what amount of O2 is required for complete reaction? What amounts of lead to oxide and sulfur dioxide are expected? So let me get out a fresh sheet of paper here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite this equation down 2 PBS, and we don't really care about the states. We need to put a 2 there. And of course, you want to make sure that it's balanced. So we have two leads, two leads, six oxygen, two oxygen here, plus four oxygen here for six, two sulfur, and two sulfur. So this is balanced. And here's what an amounts table looks like. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to list uh, all three of these, uh, or all four of these things. So we're going to have PBS, that's one. O2, that's another. PBO, that's another, and SO2, that's another. And for the amounts table, you want to know what you're beginning with, you want to know what the change is, and you want to know what you're going to end with. Some people, instead of beginning, they put initial, and this is called an ICE table or an ICE table. Now, when we're talking about amounts, we're talking about moles of substances or how many. Okay, so according to this, we're starting with 2.5 mole of PBS. So we're starting with 2.5 mole of PBS. Now we're asked what amount of O2 is required for complete reaction. So for complete reaction, we're going to say 2.5 mole of PBS times 3 mole of O2 per two mole 
of PBS. So where did I get those numbers from? Well, we get them from the balanced reaction. Whenever you're going from mole to mole, use the coefficients of the balanced reaction. So here, if we do the work here, 2.5 times three ends up being what? Uh, six plus half of three is 1.5. 7.5 divided by two puts you at about 3.8, right? 3.75 mole of O2. And I'm gonna double check my work here. 2.5 times three divided by two. And I get 3.75. Now this really should be 3.8. So I'm gonna put 3.8 mole of O2. And this would be the idealized perfect reaction where we have just a, the correct amount of lead two sulfide to react with just the correct amount of oxygen. Okay, now if we, this reaction goes to completion, what is the change gonna be? Well, all of the lead two sulfide should be gone. All of the oxygen should be gone and we should end up with zero moles of lead two sulfide and zero moles of O2. I'm gonna put slashes through there so that we know there are zeros and not oxygens, okay? And, and here I did put O2 here and I didn't put lead two sulfide but there's no real need to put the O2s here because we have the header above. So this is a, the, an amounts table, if you will. Now, what amounts of lead two oxide and sulfur dioxide are required? So let's take a look. So we're gonna start off with our 2.5 moles of lead two sulfide. And to calculate the lead two oxide, we're gonna put two moles of lead two oxide over two moles of lead two sulfide. And here, I don't even need the calculator to say that I should have 2.5 mole of lead two oxide. So here, our initial, we're starting off with zero is presumably, and we're gonna add 2.5 mole of lead two oxide, and we'll end up with 2.5 mole. So basically, to get this bottom number, you add the two numbers above. So this plus this is zero, this plus this is zero, this plus this is 2.5. Now, to get the sulfur dioxide, we start off with the moles of lead to sulfide again, multiplied by two mole of sulfur dioxide times two mole of lead to sulfide. And again, we get 2.5 mole of, whoops, sulfur dioxide. So here we're starting off with zero. Presumably we're adding 2.5 moles over the reaction and we end up with 2.5 moles. So this is called a amounts table. Now we know that uh, this is how much we'll react with this. Suppose, suppose this were the case. So this is a new amounts table. So we've got lead to sulfide, We've got O2, we've got PBO, and we've got SO2. And we're gonna react 2.5 mole of this. So this is the initial, I stands for initial. And we know that if all of this, uh, or I should say at the beginning, we have zero of the products. Now we know we need 3.8 moles of O2, right? What if we had not 3.8 moles, but what if we had 4.8 mole? Okay, so the change. Let's assume all the 2.5 mole of lead two sulfide react because there's more than enough oxygen to react with it. So if all of this reacts, how much of the oxygen will react? Well, the answer is only 3.8 mole. Now these are negatives because they're reacting and they're going away. How much lead two oxide will we make? 2.5 mole and sulfur dioxide, 2.5 mole. So these are pluses because you're making them, not using them up. And if you look at the ending, you're gonna end up with zero moles of lead two sulfide. You're gonna end up with one mole of oxygen and 2.5 mole 
of lead 2 oxide and 2.5 mole of sulfur dioxide. Now remember, these are reactants and these are products. Now here you'll notice in this case, we have some of one of our reactants left over. When you have a case like this where they aren't evenly matched or stoichiometrically matched, you say that this guy is limiting because it limits how much you make of the product. And this one is in excess because you have leftovers. So that's the whole idea behind uh, a limiting reactant type of problem is that sometimes you don't have the stoichiometric ratio that you need for a perfect reaction. Sometimes you have an excess of one of your reactants. And we wanna know based on these reactions, well, which one is in excess and which one is limiting. Now, let's take a look at uh, uh, conceptually what we're talking about here. So here's some more information about this limiting reactant type of problem. So this is a uh, reactions in which one reactant is in limited supply. Sometimes the perfect proportions of reactants are not used. And that's especially the case when you have one of the reactants that's really expensive. And the other one is very inexpensive. So to minimize the cost of the reaction, you wanna make sure that the more expensive reactant is used up completely, that you don't have any leftovers. You wanna make it uh, as uh, productive as possible. Now, what about the less expensive uh, reactants? Well, you don't care about that one because it's inexpensive. So if water's one of your reactants, that's the one where you don't care how much you use. Uh, if you use all of it, great. If you don't, so what? You got leftover water. Now, the more expensive reactant ends up being the limiting reactant. It limits how much you can make. So let's take a look at a reaction here. Here, this is a compound called propane. And if you know anything, it's, it's expensive to buy propane. You can go get it at the store. It costs you a good amount, uh, like $5 for a little quart size container. Um, I'm not sure how much those big tanks cost, but there's probably like $40. And oxygen is free. We breathe it. No one charges you to breathe oxygen. So in this reaction, this is expensive and this is inexpensive. So in this reaction, you want to use up all of the propane because oxygen is free. So in this case, your propane would be the limiting reactant and your oxygen would be the stuff that you have in excess. So let's look at some definitions here that you need to know. One is limiting reactant the reactant that limits the amount of product that can be formed. Excess reactant, the reactant or reactants that will have leftovers unreacted after the limiting reactant is used up. And there's something called the theoretical yield, which is the amount, which means moles, or mass of product form based on the limiting reactant. So here's the idea of why we base the theoretical yield on the limiting reactant. Here I've drawn a bicycle frame. So here's one bicycle frame. And we know that if we add two wheels to this, we'll have pretty much a complete bicycle. So the stoichiometry is one to two to one, one to two to one. So here I wrote down, if you have two frames and 10 wheels are used, how many bikes can you make? Well, two bikes, because you only have two frames Although with 10 wheels, technically you could make five bikes, you don't have enough frames to make five bikes. So in this case, the frames are limiting, the wheels are in excess, and our theoretical yield is two bikes, okay? So how do you tell which reactant is limiting? With the bikes, it was a very simple, simple thing to look at. You know, with two frames, you can make two bikes. With 10 wheels, you can make five bikes. So are you gonna make two bikes or are you gonna make five? Well, you're gonna make two because you can run out of enough material before you make five. So how do we do it in the book? Well, here's one way to do it. You start with one reactant and calculate the amount or mass of the other reactant needed 
and then you compare the amounts. So if you calculate that you need five grams of Y and you only have four grams of Y, Y is limiting. If you find out you need five grams of Y and you have 15 grams of Y, then Y is in excess. Also, you could make an amounts table, okay? So let's take a look at this in practice. So here we have a reaction with the limiting reactant, methanol, CH3OH, which can be used as a fuel in racing cars and in fuel cells, can be made by the reaction carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So here we go. Suppose 356 grams of carbon monoxide and 65 grams of hydrogen are mixed and allowed to react. What mass of methanol can be produced? And then B, what mass of excess reactant remains after the limiting reactant has been consumed? So let's take a look at this where we figure out how much H2 we need for 356 grams of CO2. So I'm gonna write the reaction out again. CO plus two H2 gives you CH3OH. We're gonna start with 356 grams of carbon monoxide. And we're gonna start off with 65.0 grams of H2. And we're gonna calculate the limiting reactant. Calculate or determine the limiting reactant. And what we're gonna do is we're going to determine the mass of H2 needed for 356 grams of carbon monoxide. So we've done this stoichiometry thing a few times. So rather than map it out, I'm just gonna show you the solution and hopefully you're at that point now where you can follow this very easily. So I will map it out for you though. We're gonna take our 356 grams of carbon monoxide turn that into moles of carbon monoxide. And of course we need the molar mass of carbon monoxide. Turn that into moles of H2. And of course for this, we need a balanced reaction, which we have above. And then we're gonna turn that into grams of H2. So here we go, 356 grams of CO times one mole of CO per Let's see, 12 and 16 is 28, 28.01 grams of CO times two mole of H2 per one mole of CO from a balanced reaction, and then times 2.016 grams of H2 per one mole of H2. Okay, so for 356 grams, we're gonna need this answer here. So. Uh, if we take a look, two times two is four. Four will go into uh, 28, how many times? Four times? Four will go into 356, well, four will go into uh, about 90 times. So this is 90-ish. So let's check out the answer. 356 times two times 2.016 divided by 28.01, and we get, how did I do my calculation correctly? Four, seven, seven will go into, oh, five times. Oh, I don't, what was I thinking? I was thinking uh, four will go into that. It's seven will go into that about five times, or 50 times. So we get 51 point uh, two grams of H2 needed. Okay, so we need 51.2 grams of H2. We have 65.0 grams of H2. Uh, so that means we will have leftover H2. 
So we could even make an amounts table now. And instead of making the amounts table, we can make a mass table instead. So a mass table. So for our mass table, I'm going to do CO, H2, and CH3OH. We're starting off with 356 grams. We're starting off with 65 grams. And we find out that if we use 356 grams of CO, we're going to use 51.2 grams of H2. Okay. And what are we going to have left over? Zero grams. And here we're going to have left over, uh, we'll have to do 65 minus that. So this minus this is eight. So that's three minus one is two. And then six minus that is one. So we'll have 12.8 grams left over. Now, at the beginning of the reaction, so this is the initial, and this is the change, and this is the ending, we have zero grams of methanol. What is the change for methanol going to be? Well, it's pretty easy to figure out. We just have to add those two numbers together, right? Uh, with the law of the conservation of matter, we can add these masses together, whereas if they were moles, we wouldn't be able to. So the change here is going to be, uh, let's see, three, 56 plus 51.2. So this is 407 grams. So that means that the CO is limiting, H2 is excess, and using our amounts table, we're going to make 407 grams of CH3 theoretical yield. Okay, now let's take a look at something else here. What mass of methanol uh, can be produced? Uh, let's see. We can try this another way. So let's try this. Uh, I'm going to start instead with 65.0 grams of H2, and I'm going to uh, calculate the grams of CO needed. Okay, so here we go with that. 65.0 grams of H2 times one mole of H2 per 2.016 grams of H2 times one mole of CO to two mole of H2 and then times 28.01 grams of CO per one mole of CO. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing the reverse of what I've done above. I'm going to calculate how many grams of CO I need for my H2 and see if we have enough carbon monoxide to react with all of this hydrogen. So let's do the calculation here. We have 65 times 28.01, which is roughly 60 times 30, right? So 60 times 30 is uh, 1,800 divided by 4, puts you at about... Uh, 400, I think. So we're going to divide by 2.016 and divide by 2. Then we get 452 grams of CO needed. And we have only 356 grams. So that means that we don't have enough carbon monoxide to react with all of the H2 but we have enough carbon monoxide to react with some of the H2. So this is limiting and this is excess. So that's a, you know, kind of the way to figure out which one is limiting and which one is in excess. Uh, you can start with one, figure out how much you need of the other and compare. Now I'm gonna show you another way to calculate how much you need in excess or which one is in excess and which one is limiting. So you don't see this way very often. Uh, I don't think I ever see it in books, but I'm going to show you how I like to do it. So here's the reaction again. 
then it's balanced. We're starting off with 356 grams here. And we're starting off with 65.0 grams here. And we're gonna use this analogy. So do you remember the bike analogy? So I'm gonna show you how to draw a bike. Uh, you draw a triangle and then connect another triangle to it. And you can see that this is gonna be where the back wheel goes. So the front wheel needs a fork and handlebars, and then you need a seat. So here's your bicycle frame, plus your two wheels. And you put them together. And you get, and the wheels are really easy because you just gotta remember that you draw the wheel with the center on the end of the fork. And the other wheel is centered on the end of that triangle. And you've got yourself a bicycle. They use the same analogy at UC Davis for limiting reactants. At least they did for my daughter's class. And just to let you know what high quality education you're getting here at CR compared to UC Davis, this is what they draw. One bite, I don't know what this is. This is just, I think this is what they call a strider where you get on it and just, I don't know. So this is CR, this is UC Davis. At least we teach you how to draw a bicycle. Okay, so imagine if you will that you have two frames here and we have excess wheels here. How many bikes are you gonna make? Two. Imagine you have excess frames here and you have 10 wheels here. How many bikes are you gonna make? Five. Imagine you have two here and 10 here. How many bikes are you gonna make? Two. The point here is that you can compare how much you're gonna make based on one of the two reactants and compare these amounts, how much you're gonna make, you're gonna make the lesser of the two amounts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 356 grams of CO, multiply by one mole of CO per, what is that, 28.01 grams of CO times one mole of methanol to one mole of CO. And we're going to get, oh, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually I'm gonna multiply by the molar mass of methanol. So the molar mass of methanol is one carbon, 12.01 grams, one oxygen, 16.00 grams, four hydrogens, 4.032 grams for a gram total of 0 0.04, and that's a 32, 32.04 grams of methanol per one mole of methanol. And let's see what we get here. Clear. So I think we're gonna get a number that's roughly a little bigger than 356 because 32 divided by 28 is a little more than one. So 356 times 32.04 divided by 28.01 is equal to 407 grams of methanol. And now I'm gonna do the same thing with my hydrogen. Here, I'm going to get rid of this guy because it looks like an equal. I'm going to make sure you know that's a times. We're going to multiply this out. And remember, whichever number is smaller, that's how much we're going to make. Just like here, whichever number is smaller, that's how much we're going to make. Okay, so let's multiply the, the numbers, 65. 
times 32.04 divided by 2.06 and divided by 2. And we get 516, actually 517 grams. So this is correct. And it means that CO is limiting. And this is incorrect because it's the bigger number. And that means that H2 is in excess. So the smaller number tells you how much you're going to make, and it tells you which one is limiting. The larger number tells you which one is in excess. And we arrived at the same conclusion this way versus the other way. Okay. Now, we were supposed to calculate the mass of uh, methane. Oop, let me go back here. We were also supposed to calculate the mass of methanol that you were going to make. And uh, here is the problem if I can find it. Where is the original problem? See if I can find the original problem here. Oh, I have the feeling the original problem is right there. Okay, so notice one of the things that we're supposed to do is calculate the mass of methanol that can be produced, and we calculated 407 grams. So this third way of calculating which one is in excess and which one is limiting also gives you the mass of product. That's why I like to do it. Okay. So here, what mass of the excess reactant remains after the limiting reactant has been consumed? That's where you really want to have that amounts table. So with that amounts table, remember, we can make it into a mass table and we can do the same thing. So we'll have 12.8 grams left over. So that's the answer to B. Okay, so let's try it again. Here's another problem. Sodium sulfide, Na2S, is used in the leather industry to remove hair from hides. The Na2S is made by the reaction sodium sulfate plus four carbon give you sodium sulfide and four carbon monoxide. Suppose you mix 15 grams of this with 7.5 grams of this, which is the limiting reactant, and what mass of sodium sulfide is produced. So I'm going to go ahead and use the method that I like best, I'm going to calculate the mass of product produced. So which mass of product am I going to try to calculate, this one or this one? And the answer is, well, since they want mass of sodium sulfide, I'm going to calculate the amount of this product. Because when I do that, I'll get the answer I need. So I'm going to rewrite the equation, Na2SO4 plus four carbon gives you Na2S plus four CO. And they want to know which is the limiting reactant and what mass of Na2S is produced. So my strategy is to take the 15 grams of sodium sulfate and convert that into grams of sodium sulfide and take the 7.5 grams of carbon and convert that into grams of sodium sulfide. Okay, and see which one gives me the smaller amount. So to do this, I'm gonna need the molar mass of sodium sulfate. So the molar mass of sodium sulfate is gonna be 22.99 times two for two sodiums, one sulfur, which is 32.07. And I have four oxygens. 
Okay, so if I double this, it's basically 23 twice is 46, 45.98 grams. This is 64.00 grams. Grand total is five, carry the one, zero, carry the one, 12, carry the one, 142.02. Let's see if that makes sense very quickly. 23 plus 23 is 46. 46 plus 32 is, 46 plus 30 is uh, 78. 78 plus 64 should put it, yeah, 142. That sounds about right. Now, what is the molar mass of carbon? 12. Now, what is the molar mass of sodium sulfide? That's going to be 45.98 grams plus one sulfur, 32.07 grams. Carry the one carry the one, and we get 78.05 grams. So this is sodium sulfide, and this is sodium sulfate. So I'm gonna start off with 15 grams, and let me take a look at the problem a little more closely here. Not 15, it's not 15.0, so 15 grams of sodium sulfate times one mole of sodium sulfate per 142.05 grams of sodium sulfate times one mole of sodium sulfide to one mole of sodium sulfate and then times 78.05 grams of sodium sulfide to one mole of sodium sulfide. So this is calculating how much sodium sulfide we're gonna make starting with 15 grams of sodium sulfate. And just a quick estimate, 15 will go into that 10 times, 80 divided by 10 is about eight. So the answer is gonna be around eight, probably a little more. Uh, because this doesn't go into that quite 10 times. Okay, so we got 15 times 78.05 divided by 142.05. And I get 8.2 grams of sodium sulfide. Now I'm gonna do the same for my 7.5 grams of carbon times one mole of carbon per 12.01 grams of carbon times one mole of sodium sulfide times four mole of carbon. This is from the balanced reaction times 78.05 grams of sodium sulfide to one mole of sodium sulfide. And I'm gonna do this in my head real quick. Um, let's see, four will go into 80 20 times. 20 divided by 12 is about two, but a little bit less than two. A little bit less than two times 7.5 uh, puts that at uh, probably around 10, 11, or 12, something like that. So 7.5 times 78.05 divided by 12.01 and divided by four is equal to 12 point, well, only two significant figures. So 12 grams of sodium sulfide. So using these two numbers here, the 8.2 grams of sodium sulfide is the theoretical yield. Because it is smaller than 12 grams. Second thing I can say is that the sodium sulfate is limiting and it is limiting because it's the one that gave me the smaller amount. 
And lastly, I can say that the carbon is in excess because it gave me the larger amount. So when we go to look at the answer for the question, what is the limiting reactant? Sodium sulfate. Which, uh, what mass is produced? 8.2 grams. And here's all the work you need to do. It's just basically two stoichiometry problems. And I find that a lot easier than any other way. But you're welcome to do it any other way as long as your logic is clear and easy for me to follow. Okay, so that's a limiting reactant type problem. Thank you for listening.